up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast with me, the human performance mechanic, co-founder of the BFR Pros, and blessed with the real name of Nicholas Rolnick. Um, I'm a physical therapist and strength and conditioning coach, and I am an expert in blood flow restriction training and muscle hypertrophy. And I wanted to take today's uh, episode to dive into a little bit of my thoughts regarding um, how many repetitions we need to be able to do in order to stimulate muscle growth to the same capacity as high load resistance exercise. Because if you remember and we think about the importance of blood flow restriction training in rehab contexts, it's because we can induce similar amounts of muscle growth to high intensity strength training. And when we're in rehab, we're dealing with people that are load and pain compromised, two factors that make it very difficult to achieve the gold standard high load resistance exercise. We go through all of this and more in our on-demand BFR training certification course on BFRtraining.com. And um, really, if this is a, an extension of that because since that course was produced, um, there have been uh, multitudes of research articles that have come out that have compared low load resistance exercise, typically performed between 20 and 30% of the one repetition maximum, and high load resistance exercise, typically greater than 70% of the one rep max. And, you know, it's my, my passion to try to reduce the barriers for the adoption of blood flow restricted exercise. And that is something that, um, that really has led me down my path of research. So to take a step back here, right, for those that may have stumbled upon this podcast, BFR is in all intents and purposes, we're using something like a blood pressure cuff that has been specialized to be able to restrict arterial inflow and occlude venous return. That allows for an additional accumulation of muscle fatigue at any given loading range. And that allows for us to accelerate the normally occurring processes that happen with low load resistance exercise and thus we can stimulate muscle growth to a similar extent as if we were lifting heavy. Um, now there is you know something to be said about um, its use in rehab right because what we do know are a couple things. We know that currently there exists a minimum pressure threshold that is probably needed to be hit in order to <clears throat> accelerate that fatigue from you know to to occur. If we don't hit that <clears throat> level of pressure then we're setting ourselves up or our clients or patients up to not get the effects of blood flow restricted exercise, which when we think about resistance exercise, which is something that I'm very passionate about and I think that everybody should get their, their patients to that level um, where they're able to do resistance exercise. If we think about that, then I want to be as sure as possible to get that beneficial effect. And in order to do that, then we need to use cuffs that are able to relativize the pressure. And, it, and the research currently suggests that we need about 40 to 50% of arterial or limb occlusion pressure to meaningfully accelerate fatigue compared to a low load control. And then after we've determined, all right, what pressure we're going to use, then the next step is repetitions. And what we do know is that 
higher pressures, so above 40 to 50 percent of the of the limb occlusion pressure of that individual, will increase perceptual demand, meaning that that you're going to have to work harder and you're going to experience more exercise induced discomfort either from the pressure of the cuff itself on the limb or from the trapped metabolites that are produced during the exercise with BFR. And these levels of discomfort can get very high. Um, that is important to understand because any sort of exercise is going to induce high levels of discomfort <clears throat> as we approach volitional fatigue. But my whole thought process is we know that there is going to need to be some significant amount of discomfort that is experienced by the exerciser. And we know that in regular training, the more, you know, volume of exercise that you do, the greater levels of discomfort you will experience because that person is going to be working closer to volitional fatigue, right? And we need to get to some degree of proximity to failure when we are exercising with or without BFR. So then it comes back to, for me, okay, well, we know that there might need to be a minimum amount of pressure needed to meaningfully accelerate fatigue. And then when we get to the repetition schemes that have been proposed currently, they're composed of four sets of, total, of, of repetitions totaling 75, meaning that they do four total sets. The first set is 30 repetitions followed by a 30 second rest, typically, uh, although it can go up to a minute, followed by three sets of 15. And that is a lot of volume. I mean, think about it. Like, how many times are you gonna have, if you're a physical therapist and you're working with people that are, that are load and or pain compromised, how often are you gonna have them do 75 repetitions of anything? Probably not often at all. Um, that is a ton of volume. And then we get the second repetition scheme that's, that's recommended, which is four, um, I th typically it's done three to four sets to volitional fatigue. And that literature that has been currently published, yeah, we get the same amount of muscle growth, great. Um, and with BFR, we can do it quicker than low load exercise alone. But that amount of discomfort that's experienced by the exerciser is pretty damn high when you're thinking about the, um, you're thinking about whether or not that person needs to get into that level of discomfort to experience muscle growth. And the current research right now is saying that there is likely a proximity to failure that we need to hit in order to meaningfully stimulate muscle growth. And that, in a recent meta-regression, um, I think the lead author is Ruffalo or Robinson or something like that, um, they showed that you know, in some populations, there might only need to be, we need to be within eight repetitions of failure. Um, others kind of go to proximities to failure within five reps. So if you can do a 10 rep max um, and you're doing five reps at your 10 rep max, you're really not getting any hypertrophic stimulus. You need to do at least six reps in order to, to get a hypertrophic stimulus. Um, so that's kind of the, the rudimentary model that has been used. So the research in blood flow restriction is firmly supplanted in these 30, 15, 15, 15 repetition schemes or sets to volitional fatigue. And they both have importance 
in helping us as clinicians, but also uh, myself as a, as a researcher, understand the demands of the exercise, right? And there, there's always questions that I get asked, why 30, 15, 15, 15? And to my understanding, it really was just a protocol that was studied, that was found to be effective, and thus started to get replicated in study after study after study. Um, and in failure exercise is pretty standard um, to look at the maximal demands of a system, right? So if I have somebody exercise to, uh, you know, three sets on a leg press, but I have them do three sets of 10 and they could do three sets of 20 at that, well then that response that I'm gonna measure, whatever that response might be acutely, might be chronically, like looking at muscle hypertrophy, for example, chronically or looking at um, like perceptual demands acutely, whatever. <clears throat> then you have the failure exercise where you look at, all right, well, three sets of 20 then is, is being done. What is the, you know, maximal type of stimulus that can be given? Um, and, and then you have stuff in between where you have other repetition schemes that have been studied. Three sets of 20, you know, three sets of 15, four sets of 15, etc. And so for me, understanding and teaching blood flow restriction for, um, for over eight years now um, and really um, having a lot of experience working with patients and myself with BFR, um, it is strenuous. It sucks. It, it really is not fun. It takes a special type of person, the masochist, to really enjoy that. Those are the bodybuilders, the crossfitters, the people that have been really accustomed to metabolic stress type training. And we go over all the different BFR personality types in our on-demand course. Um, but, you know, the majority of people tolerate it. These are the battlers. And these are the people that I want to keep on blood flow restriction training. They're not going to like it, but they'll do it because they tell you, you know, they, they, they believe that, that it's going to be a therapeutic modality that's going to help them get what they want and accelerate their performance and recovery back faster than other traditional methods of, of therapy. And those are the people that, yeah, like, you know, generally speaking, they're the vast majority of people um, that you'll come across. And these are the people that I really, you know, again, I want to be considerate for how stressful the exercise is because again these people are not totally you know on board and if we program too aggressively we might lose them and programming too aggressively could simply just be i'm going to put them immediately on failure exercise or i'm going to put them on the 30 15 15 15 immediately or i'm going to now use instead of 40 percent pressure i'm going to use 80 percent pressure on the legs right my whole thought as somebody who loves blood flow restriction training, who thinks that this is the future of physical therapy. And in a small percentage of people, I think that uh, our small population, I think it could be the future of athletic um, performance optimization. And that's another podcast um, entirely. But I do think that it has the potential to reach a ton of people. And so then we have the quitters, and the quitters are the people that may not have had any sort of resistance exercise experience. Um, we kind of classified um, the, the quitters in our uh, 2021 perceived uh, barriers to blood flow restriction training paper in Frontiers in Physiology as people that really have not resistance trained ever or certainly within six months. And these are the people that you want to be very careful about the programming. So. For me, looking at the repetition schemes that are commonly purported to be a benefit to blood flow restricted exercise and giving the outcomes needed to be equivalent to high load exercise, I am interested in, do we really need to do that much volume of exercise to be able to get the benefits of blood flow restricted exercise? That to me is a super important question, especially when we're thinking about the quitter and that person who 
is you know very apprehensive about, B, about BFR, and we haphazardly start to get them on exercise, you know, multi-joint exercises at high pressures, at high volumes immediately. Those are the people that probably need BFR the most because they're the ones that um, are deconditioned and BFR could really help them get there. So there's, that's a passion of mine and, and that's the background as to why myself and Victor DeCaros and my other co-authors, Brad Schoenfeld, Ocon, Kamis, and more, um, were really interested in all right, well, what is the current body of evidence on different repetition schemes? And do those repetition schemes produce equivalent amounts of muscle hypertrophy as high load resistance exercise? So that was the background, right? And, 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 and just a quick synopsis, right? We know that more volume, higher perceptual demands. We know that higher pressures equals higher perceptual demands. And we know that BFR is not stress, is not a walk in the park. Um, certainly shouldn't be. And if your patients are saying that they, it's a walk in the park, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, my whole thing is let's get BFR more adopted. So with that being said, we went in and we looked at the totality of evidence that was using gold standard approaches or some of the gold standard approaches to measure muscle hypertrophy. What are these things? Their MRI, their musculoskeletal ultrasound, their um, computer imaging, PQST um, uh, imaging. We did not include studies that, that, that uh, measured it via limb circumference because that's just not sensitive and specific enough to give us an understanding of the relative magnitude of muscle growth that could be experienced in, um, in a, longitudinal, uh, a longitudinal trial. And we wanted to update the pivotal Lixandro study um, that was published in 2018. And the thing was though, this has been, stu uh, this has been cited well over 400 times. I've, stu I've cited this paper at least 20 times in um, my various uh, publications. Um, but it really, at the end of the day, only had 10 studies that were included in this analysis. Um, so what we wanted to do is update it and then provide a little bit more guidance as to maybe we don't need that amount of repetitions, right? The 30, 15, 15, 15, or the sets to fatigue. So we searched four different databases commonly used to, um, to screen articles. And our inclusion criteria was 18, or 18 years or older, healthy adult participants. They could be trained or untrained. And we, needed, we wanted to make sure that, um, that there had to be a high load comparator. Uh, we specified high load as greater than 70% of the one rep max, and they had to use gold standard um, imaging technology so we can measure the relative magnitude of muscle growth. So with that being said, we ended up with 23 studies. So we had over double the amount of research that was included in our uh, systematic review and meta-analysis. And so after that then, you know, we, we plotted it up on the forest plot and we showed that as we would expect the resultant muscle growth following low load resistance exercise with BFR and which we, which we included at 20 to, you know, under 50%, but really we wanted like clinically, clinically relevant, um, clinically relevant loading ranges, which are less than 30%. So we got that and we then said, all right, well, we supported the fact that, you know, BFR can induce similar amounts of muscle growth. Great. We kind of knew that and that was really expected. But then what we wanted to do is say, all right, well, we have all this data, 495 participants, right? We have all this data. 
what is going to be the difference between repetition ranges? So then we stratified the repetition ranges according to three different repetition, uh, repetition schemes. The first one is the 30, 15, 15, 15. The second one was multiple sets to volitional fatigue, which are the two that are recommended by Patterson et al. in their 2019 blood flow restriction training consideration methodology paper that was published in Frontiers in Physiology. And then we saw that there was a number of studies that were using multiple sets of 15 repetitions. So we said, all right, let's group those together and let's meta-analyze in a subgroup analysis. We returned that the result in hypertrophy in all these different loading schemes was identical to heavy load or high load exercise. That was really shocking um, because the the repetitions that were used were three to four sets of 15. And the loads that were used in all the BFR studies were between 20 and 30% of the one rep max. Again, mirroring Patterson et al. and his study. So that was great. And then we decided, all right, well, let's stratify according to upper versus lower body. And believe it or not, it turned out that in the lower body exercise, hypertrophy probably was equivocal regardless of the repetition scheme adopted um, in either low load exercise or with BFR versus um, high load resistance exercise without BFR. But then we did see a small beneficial effect of high load exercise over low load exercise with blood flow restriction in the upper body. And before we kind of get carried away with that, um, I think it's really important to point out that we had very limited comparisons. Um, I think it was four or five comparisons in the upper body versus multiple more in the lower body. Um, so thinking about that, I think we, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater yet, but that's the current state of evidence uh, that we have now. So we're definitely welcoming more. But the really cool thing that our analysis has begun to suggest, right? Because the evidence right now is very preliminary. Uh, me personally, I, um, I have not used 30 repetitions on the first set in well over a year. Um, the only time that I use 30 repetitions followed by three sets of 15 is very low intensity exercise. That type of exercise where, where the loads are less than 20% of the one rep max, right, estimated, and we'll talk in another podcast kind of about the trials and tribulations of really hitting that loading range with blood flow restriction. But I tend to um, bias the four sets of 15 once individuals can start to load in really any capacity um, because <clears throat> it is more tolerable and I do believe that we should want to progress load before we progress pressure or alter the repetition scheme, right? And that, well, that depends on what our goals are, right? <clears throat> but if we're doing three sets of 15, then yeah, I want to probably do four sets of 15 before I increase the load. But if I'm doing the 30, 15, 15, 15 protocol and I don't want to have them go to failure, well, then I want them to increase the load before I would increase the the intensity of the exercise. And that's a real whole other topic in and of itself because I strongly feel that the 30, 15, 15, 15 protocol actually has a large maybe not a majority, but a large minority of participants unable to complete the prescribed repetition scheme. So it ends up being actually closer to failure effort match exercise than, you know, a non-failure fixed repetition protocol. But, but again, um, that is just something that uh, is evolving and I'm interested to learn more about. But yeah, so we, we then, you know, came away with this this study suggesting that maybe we don't need that four sets of 75 reps and maybe we only need four sets of 15. Um, as long as the loads are within 20 to 30% of the warrant max, that's a huge, huge caveat because if you're not using loads in that level of of, of, you know, percent of one rep max, then you're probably not inducing enough fatigue in order to really mimic the effects of high intensity resistance exercise at the muscular level. 
big, big, big caveat. So our research, in conclusion, comes uh, with the conclusion that, hey, if we can, if we know that more volume increases the perceptual demands of the exercise, and we know that based upon all of our experiences that that long-term compliance in a large major, maybe large minority, right, of patients is an issue because BFR is so stressful, well, maybe we can reduce the total amount of volume that we can perform in a resistance exercise session to give them the same benefits as high load exercise. This opens up the door for other research now to study this repetition scheme protocol and see if it reinforces our findings, right? When we're thinking about muscle growth, I'm thinking that, and what we saw in our article, was regardless of the repetition scheme adopted, the resultant hypertrophy tends to be within four to eight percent, whether it's heavy loading or light loading with BFR. So that is the the baseline for me looking at a hypertrophy based study is I'm expecting between that value. Um, so I'm interested in looking at future research that um, compares repetition schemes. I mean, the gold standard <clears throat> would really be a three um, would be a three-arm study. One has four sets of 15, the other has 30, 15, 15, 15, and the other has four sets to volitional fatigue. And looking at perceptual demands, the overall adherence to the, um, the intervention, the likelihood to perform again, meaning like how likely that individual will be to repeat the exercise in the future, and then looking at longitudinal muscle growth. That would be the gold standard to really look at whether or not the, the repetition scheme matters and the magnitude of differences, which I would expect it's probably all noise, meaning that we'll see an equivocal uh, muscle mass accretion in all of these repetition schemes that are adopted. So yeah, um, that is my thoughts on the... Um, the new research that's been published, you can access it on Peer J. I'll have a link in the show notes for the paper, um, as well as an infographic for an easy digestible, um, digestible format, as well as a video um, summarizing the most important parts of this analysis. So you have any questions? Let's discuss. Post, post below and let me know your thoughts. And if you've listened this far and you are interested in getting certified through the BFR Pros, I'd love to have you. We have over 11 hours of content, including the most up-to-date research that has been published. You can just uh, post course below and I'll send you $100 off our on-demand course for being a loyal listener. Catch you again. Thanks for tuning in. And that was today's episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, I would love if you subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're watching or listening on. I really appreciate the support.